Okay. Just for those who are joining the recording, we're, we're kind of looking at a, uh, a few slides on research methodology. And right now I'm starting just to talk about uh, Institutional Review Board, which uh, some proposals may need to uh, be reviewed by our Institutional Review Board because they meet uh, two, two criteria. Number one, a, a research project that's going to deal with vul called vulnerable populations. That kind of a research will be subject to review by our review board. Uh, you know, vulnerable populations are uh, minors. Anybody under age 18, for example, is considered a vulnerable population. Uh, people who have any kind of uh, handicaps are considered that. Uh, people in prison are considered vulnerable populations. There's several criteria. Uh, and the, the, con the material I put on the info page will go over those, what a vulnerable population is. So you'll be able to kind of see, does, does your particular research fall into that category? The second, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. In my case, all, ma all the materials, invitation, and everything will be in Portuguese. Uh, should I include any way? Should I translate? Should I, what should I do? I missed one line. You, you, the people you're working with are going to be what? What was, this, what was the uh, category you said? No, I'm, uh, I'm going to create some invitations and even flyers to invite the community to come. Okay. But all the material will be written in Portuguese. Oh, I see. Okay, that's that's fine. <laughs> should I do it anyway? Should I translate? Should I create a version in English? Well, well yeah, you really do. Just for those of us who don't speak Portuguese, you know, we probably so we can at least look at that. Yeah. So um, in the invitation, and that would be fine. You know, in your situ in your situation, Paula, I'm not sure if you're gonna if your if your research would fall into what I'm gonna call a second category here is sensitive information. Would you be asking anybody about their financial status or about their living conditions or any of those kinds of issues? Yes, I do. Okay, okay. so, so what, what that's going to mean, people who actually are gonna participate in your particular study, they would need to fill out, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd make a consent form, and then they would have to uh, sign that consent form, and it just kind of, and we've got a sample consent form that I also loaded into the uh, info, info section. So yeah, okay. you would have to use that consent form. And it sounds like, you know, those of us on the Institutional Review Board, I had that one up, we'd have to look at that proposal to make sure that, you know, it's got all the right content there. You know, and the reason that be is that, you know, two issues, you know, we have to meet that standard because we're a school in the United States and we, we fall under the, the guidelines of the Department of Health and Human Services for any kind of human research, right? Uh, and since, since you're attending a you know, school in the United States, your dissertation work research falls under our guidelines, right? Um, so somebody, if anybody decided to sue us as a school or you as a student, <laughs> We want to at least make sure that we've kind of had, we've got our information uh, documented and we have consent forms and, and those kinds of issues. Okay. And then we okay. have to do, and we wish to want to make sure, and of course, I think Dr. Henry talked about this last time, you know, there, there were some, some abuse situations that were occur occurring early on that actually uh, kind of started this whole process of, 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 of guidelines, requirements for human research in the United States. So now, you know, we've got a whole policy manual that deals with these issues. If, if you go online to the United States uh, uh, Legal Code, Section 45, that whole section deals with uh, this whole issue of human research. Anyway, yeah, you will probably, you will need yeah. to have a consent form. Sorry, Dr. Payne, may I just... Go ahead, Dr. Henry. In, in answer to Paula's um, question, and she mentioned that she'll be doing the flyers in Portuguese, that's appropriate. What she would do is in the appendix section of her, her report, she would translate those flyers into English right. so we can read them too. But it's appropriate for her to use the flyers um, in Portuguese to, to address the group that she's working with. 
And I just want to say in terms of the IRB requirement that that is not unique to the US. In other countries, for example, I'm supervising a student in Guyana and he, also, he has to do an IRB for Guyana, for the population that he's working with. So whatever country you're in, check to see what are the IRB requirements. And if you need to do an IRB for that country, then you need to do the one for BGU and the one for the country in which you're doing your study. That's important. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and every country has its own set of standards. So yes. Yeah. But you know, the United States uh, code indicates that very thing. If there are local standards in your country, you need to meet those standards as well as the standards here in the US. So yeah. yes. So very good point. All right, let's see another sample here, how the sample was recruited for a stratified random sample drawn from a university student population. All currently enrolled students were identified and women and men were divided into separate groupings. Women were assigned a number from one to 5,390, men assigned a number from one to 6,040. And it kind of goes some of these very you know, detailed issues in terms of how this sample was going to be uh, conducted. Research assistants drew numbers with a computerized random digital program and contacted women and men and asked them if they would be willing to join the study until, until by sampling with the replacement. 400 women and 400 men had agreed to be in the study. So you know, they were really working on uh, anonymity in this case, even before you know, as they were asking people to uh, respond. <laughs> uh, so you know, anonymity is important too. Uh, as, and as we look at that, when, when people participate in your uh, in your research, when you're writing up your report, for example, you want to make sure that you, you let people stay anonymous. Okay, and and then that again will be part of the criteria that's in the uh, Institution Review Board, the IRB <coughs> policy manual, anonymity. Let's see. Yeah, who collected the data? If anybody other than you, <laughs> but you do need to indicate who's going to collect data. Did others collect data, such as teachers, parents? Uh, you know, and that that happens sometimes. I've done had several students who are working, say, in schools, and they've had teachers collecting data uh, because they know their students best, and and that would be appropriate uh, if if and you need to just state that if anybody else other than yourself. Uh, you know, you, as much as possible, you as the as the researcher should be doing the uh, collecting the the data yourself, especially in interview situations. Okay, uh, but anyway, if there's going to be other people involved, you know, you need to you need to state that even in your proposal. Okay, uh, let's see. Here's again a a sample who collected data. Here's a sample. Licensed clinical social workers conducted all interviews. Social workers and participants were matched by gender, race, ethnicity, such that Hispanic American men were interviewed by Hispanic American men, African American women were interviewed by African American women, and so on. Trained research assistants collected uh, follow-up survey data by phone. But again, the, the issue here is just being as detailed as possible, and we're at the proposal stage, okay, Who's going to collect the data? Okay, uh, if it's going to be you, just just say that. You know, yeah, I as the researcher will be collecting the data, whether you're you know looking at the surveys, doing interviews, but just state that up front so that uh, those of us on the academic cabinet or the institu institutional review board know how you're going to conduct that research. Uh, another sample, here's another example. Undergraduate research assistants collected all survey data in pairs of two research assistants each time. Again, just, just uh, again, more and more samples of, of how, you know, you might word issues uh, and, and at the proposal stage. Who collected, uh, let's just see if there's any others here that might be helpful. You know, where activities take place? Was the data collected at a school? Did interviews happen at the home or at a place of a participant's choosing? Was a place where data was collected private so that a participant could feel secure in discussing confidential information? Was data collected in a lab, at a university, or in, in an institution? So again, at your proposal level, it would be important you say, you know, where are you going to do interviews? 
you know, are you going to do that as in a particular office uh, on on site where that participant happens to be? Again, just some of these details. I think we're just showing these slides to kind of bring those to your mind. Those are the kind of details that that we need to see uh, when we're uh, looking at a proposal in terms of the method methodological chapter. Samples. Interviews took place at participants' homes. You would say, you know, inter interviews will take place at participants' homes or if they preferred at an altered location of their choice, such as a coffee shop or a public library. Uh, data will be collected at schools, day centers, and after school programs in, in a metropolitan area. So again, just samples of the kind of uh, content that you'd wanna make sure you put into your, uh, your chapter. Uh, what processes or activities uh, participants engaged in? How was consent obtained? Were participants and I'll just put these in the future. How will consent be contained? Uh, did, will participants uh, be interviewed or surveyed individually or in groups, in person or by phone? Uh, that doesn't really apply. Uh, will the materials be read aloud or will participants read the material themselves? Will they take a test or view a film or a slide series? Uh, will data be collected for participants more than one at a time? Uh, how long will the activities take? Again, just again, some of that information that you need to just kind of be aware of. Example, uh, data were uh, collected. Again, these are just put in the past tense because this is a, you know, a dissertation already been done, but just translate it to the will. Data were collected from four groups of participants separately, one time for each group. Participants were seated in a college classroom. Prior to the start of the procedure, they received the informed consent document and had the opportunity to read it and ask questions and submitted their signed consent to a research assistant. Participants were first surveyed about their basic demographics, stressful life experiences, and recent anxious symptoms. Then they were shown four films each. Experimental condition, condition participants were shown four segments of a scary film, and control participants were shown four segments of a neutral film. And these activities together took approximately one hour. Okay, this, this is an experimental kind of a situation being done, you know, uh, in terms of a psychological uh, a dissertation. But the issue, what we're just trying to show is, you know, this is a procedurally, it's saying exactly what happened. And from at a proposal stage, you need to kind of put down, you know, procedurally what you anticipate doing uh, in the way you're going to be collecting data. And notice, you know, trying to be as detailed as possible, you know, at the proposal stage. Uh, process activity, samples, notes, let's see, and we just talked about shows data were collected, tells where data was collected, how the informed consent occurred, describes generally the order in which things happened, describes that a survey was distributed, describes that participants were shown a film, notes about how long the process took. Again, these are some of the kinds of issues that you would be uh, seeking to include in your proposal you know, under the sampling section and under the data uh, gathering section. Uh, you know, and try to put these in, a, in an order, in an order that you anticipate doing them. Okay, you know, first I'm going to, you know, I'm going to send out a, a, an email uh, and it's going to contain the invitation letter shown in Appendix A. Uh, I'm going to send it out to X number of uh, men and X number of women. Uh, it's going to be sent to people who are in a particular uh, demographic category or a life situation, you know, we, we looked at uh, single parents, that was a criteria used here in a few slides back. Uh, they were parents of single, uh, of, of school aged children. Again, you know, those criteria would be shown, you know, I, I think that's the word we've used in, this, in, in our proposal, you know, what criteria are you using uh, in terms of uh, selecting people to be part of your, uh, of your, uh, your process. Let's stop there and just see if there's questions, thoughts that you would like to, uh, you'd like to ask. Maybe specifically as you uh, relate it to your own, uh, the work you're doing. So Dr. Payne, my, my constituents will include university students. Mm -hmm. um, but you're saying that anybody under 18, they're, they will be um, recognized as being vulnerable. Right. Um, 
you know, if they're so, under 18, <laughs> unfortunately, then they have to have parental consent if parents are uh, available or someone, yeah, if they are a minor. Okay. And I'll have to go back and look at the IRB uh, criteria, but I'm pretty sure that's that's the issue that uh, if it, you know if they are minors, minors, mm -hmm. uh, if guardians or parental uh, consent is also required. Okay. Now, we really would encourage you to look at that, uh, that content, which is loaded into the info section. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Our proposal is due the 16th of June, correct? Uh, yeah, the total proposal. You know, this week, the end of this week, I'd like to see your method, method, methodology chapter, just so I can give you any feedback that, that I feel like you should have before you uh, put together okay. the, the final proposal. Okay. okay. Okay, other questions, thoughts? Say this will be our last session, so <laughs> ask questions. I have I have one. I don't know if at this point we should have chosen our professor or supervisor, the one that we should submit because I saw that we should send to this person until June the 30th, I think. You mean for a and supervisor? Yes, and I'm kind of stuck in that one. How to select, I mean, I didn't have the class uh, that is re related directly to the project that I'm taking, so you know what I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah, that, that's true, there, well, you know, they're like, you know, we have ABC asset-based community development, you know, Dr. Kit Danley, for example, teaches that class. I thought about her. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, she's worked with several students in relationship to some of these vulnerable populations. Uh, I was just on an oral review yesterday with, with Dr. Danley, uh, working with a, a student who was doing some stuff over in Chicago and working with a lot of vulnerable populations, uh, people who, who are on the streets, etc. You know, for example, Dr. Danley's had a lot of experience uh, in that area. Uh, and then there's others. Can well, I just send her a message asking her if she can be the yeah. one? Yeah, you could just send her an email, send her, in, indicate what, you know, what topic, what your topic is, uh, when you're going to be graduating, and then she can look at her schedule to just see, you know, would that fit into the schedule of students that she's currently working with. So yeah, you're gonna start with one person if that doesn't work out and go to another. And if they out and say doesn't work out, you know, email me and uh, I can give you a few other suggestions. We've got, you know, quite a few staff, uh, faculty people who are willing to uh, work with uh, students as, as okay. supervisors. I have a couple of uh, just very quick uh, questions I think you can answer quickly Dr. Payne. Yeah. One, one is when it comes to citing the references the 35 to 50 references if it's listed in the reference does that mean you have to have a quotation in your paper in other words is the reference list only what you're citing in your paper or does it also include other sources you might be drawing upon that you may not be citing in your paper? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah go ahead Dr. Ernie you can answer that one if you want. Okay in the references list, the APA uh, method, you only put into that list works that you have referenced in your paper. Okay. Now, if you have, um, and not if you have, we would expect that there's other work that you have not yet used, but you plan to use. Now, um, what I advise, what we advise, is that you have a, sec a separate section that is called uh, prospective resources. So that you have two lists at the end of your um, proposal. The first one would be the references, APA format, only works that you have referenced in the paper. The second one are intended resources that you will use going forward into the research. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, the, good. The other question I had, this 
it's, it looked like when I looked at the sample of references, they always abbreviated the first letter, letter of the person's first name. Uh, so I take it that's just the standard when it comes to reference. APA, yes. The yeah. APA okay. um, format is the la last name and the abbreviations of the other names. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. That's okay. APA format. You never right. use the full um, other names of the individual, just the, um, the first letter of the name. Okay. Also, I've, res I've pulled some articles that um, are checked as peer reviewed and empirical, but, they, but they're not actually, there's no journal article listed. It's just like an online paper. So how do you cite that when it doesn't list a journal, like that's part of a journal article? Okay, go to APA, APA, well, any um, reference manual is tedious, but they have instructions for everything. So you go to APA and put in, how do you reference online material that is not in a journal? And they'll give you the, the method. Okay. Yeah, let, me, let me make a couple of comments on that one too, Kevin. Uh, Number one, back to your issue you talked about in terms of uh, you know first first name initial and then the last name, and that's for the reference list. If you're when you're when you're talking about someone within the uh, text, the body text, uh, at least in APA, generally too, people usually just give the last name. They don't give you don't give the initial there. And then when you put the uh, reference, the parenthetical reference, you'd maybe say, you know, again, Smith, comma, 2015, comma, P.23. Okay, mm -hmm. so that would be, you know, somebody named Smith. But so in the text body, just use the last name. In the reference list, uh, first name, first name, initial, and then uh, last name. Also, when we're talking about you know 35 to 50 sources, that's a combination of, of, of uh, people that have been actually cited within your proposal. Okay, you'll have a parenthetical reference. It doesn't mean you have to have a quotation from them necessarily, but you've given content and you've given them credit in a parenthetical uh, reference. Those are the kinds of, of, of entries that you can put into the reference list of the proposal. As Dr. Henry said then, as you've been doing research, you're going to be finding other sources. You'd put those in the second list, which would be called, you know, perspective uh, sources or potential uh, sources, whatever you want to call it. And then, oh, the other issue, I've been encouraging you, all of you, I think, as I've been reading your papers, to make sure you look at the document called 22 Tips mm -hmm. from the Tech Reader, <laughs> okay, which is in the info yep. section under Files. One part of that section, I've actually, you know, given you examples of various APA kinds of uh, formatting styles. You know, you just mentioned, you know, I have an article from, from an internet that there's no journal, for example, but you really believe it's a peer-reviewed type article. You know, in that case, you know, you give the last name and then a comma, first initial, period, parentheses 2015 close parentheses period and then if there's nothing else cited in terms of an organization you'd put like just the the, the name of the article and in APA uh, the name of an internet article goes in sentence case we call it you know you don't do title case where you capitalize each word it's sentence case you only capitalize the first word and then, like a sentence, the rest of them are lowercase letters. And then you'd have, you know, period, and then retrieved from, and then the name of the website. And there again, you know, as Dr. Henry said, you can find that kind of formatting on, online. You know, there's a place called APA.org, which is the uh, Association uh, Psychological, the Psych Psychological Association, which is where APA comes from. Uh, I think it's APA.style.org you can look up on that site that's the official apa site you can find just about any kind of formatting you need so you know we've given i've given examples of formatting in the 22 tips and you'll find some examples of apa formatting in the current 
uh, final project handbook. And then again, the website. Yeah, so those are all resources as you're trying to figure out how to do APA uh, referencing. All right, last question. Uh, using the, the term this, I, I do understand why we need to spell out what this is, but sometimes it's, re it's almost redundant. In other words, I might have one sentence where I'm explaining that this is the, the, you know, related to my dissertation, the, the thriving, creating, cultivating a thriving multi-ethnic workforce. The next sentence, I might be referring back to that if I, if, I, if I have to spell out this every time, it sounds kind of silly, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I know that that next, everybody would know that the next sentence that says this speaks to what I just spoke, spoke mm -hmm. about in the previous sentence where I spelled it out. Yeah, I agree. It does get kind of silly sometimes. That is just an APA uh, issue. And it, it's not just APA. I've seen in other grammatical uh, for academic writing. It's just the idea of being as precise as possible so that, you know, so you aren't just having a vague this. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can restructure a sentence so you can say such and such and such and such, uh, comma, which did, 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 did. Sometimes you can, uh, you, sometimes you can eliminate the this in the next sentence just by, you know, extending the previous sentence and put in which does such and such. And I know it's difficult at times, and but it's it's just one of those APA kinds of things. Same thing with you know we, we often talk this way. <laughs> that is such right. just a common uh, style that's used in a lot of writing. But there again, you know APA says the only time you'd use we, if you're going to talk about we as a team of researchers or we as a team of leaders, you've identified specifically who you're talking about so that the reader knows exactly you know, what you mean. So I agree, at times, some of those kinds of formal uh, writing styles become a bit tedious, but it's, it's, it, it's just kind of part of that formal academic style that we have to utilize when we're doing a dissertation. So you're saying, even if it just doesn't really make any sense, still change out that this to something else, because otherwise that'll be marked down? Is that right? The technical reader will mark, mark your paper and say, you need to change that, right? Okay, all right. Uh, Kevin, that's a good question. Just to remind us of the dryness and boredom of academic writing, but if you're writing the dissertation, you have to change your style of writing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it is tedious and boring, but that's the nature of the beast. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll conform and stop bucking the system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you write, sometimes I can try to give you some, you know, some hints since I've been working at that style for a, a few years now. So, you know, if I can come up with a, you know, a, a less awkward way when I see something in your proposal, I'll try to give it to you. Excuse me, Dr. Payne. Go ahead, Tammy. Um, are you saying we choose our supervisors and email them directly? Yes, that, that is the, uh, the, the customary way that we do it at BGU, yes. If you, can, you know, if you know someone that you've had a class from and you'd like that, that person to possibly uh, think about being a supervisor, yeah, you can email them directly. You should be able to find their emails on our website. Each of the faculty members have, a web, uh, have an email address listed. So yeah. Are, just, are we supposed to have two persons, um, one the supervisor and the other reader? That is a good point. Yeah, we really do need to have a, you need to have a supervisor right, right away. You know, as you finish this class, you need to have someone that you're going to then send your proposal to. Once, once, say, Dr. Henry and I have given our comments and we give a grade, you'll then need to send that proposal to a super, someone who you've designated as a supervisor. Then he or she will give their comments and recommendations. Uh, and then you'll work out that proposal together with that supervisor until both of you are satisfied with it. And then it gets submitted to the academic cabinet for formal approval for you to be able to then go on. But yeah, you need a supervisor to begin with. Also then within the next couple of months, it would be good if you can find a second person uh, that would be called, now we're using the term, they're kind of the uh, a secondary advisor. Uh, we've called them a second reader. 
I've been trying to, uh, I guess, strengthen that particular uh, role of a second reader and, and then calling them a, an associate uh, uh, supervisor because now they are also going to receive a, a minimal fee, but they are going to receive a fee as a, a secondary uh, advisor. So yeah, if you can come up with a second person, and actually, yeah, we've just rewritten our handbook, our final project handbook, and now both the supervisor and the secondary supervisor, second reader, need to be approved by the uh, academic cabinet. And that would mainly be if they're not on the faculty of BGU, if you had someone who's from the outside. And typically, people that are already faculty members, uh, they're, they're already pre-approved, but we do need to let the academic cabinet know, you know who is your supervisor and who will be your secondary, uh, your secondary supervisor as a second reader. So once we settle with, uh, with our supervisor, we have to inform you also that this is the person we have settled with. Right. And what happens, you know, once you have, once you have an approved supervisor, then the registrar sends that supervisor a, a supervisor contract, because each of those supervisors' positions do get paid, and so they, that, that person has to fill out a contractor, the primary supervisor and the secondary supervisor, each will sign a contract so that they can get paid through the school. Okay. Well, we can still communicate with you from time to time. We can still talk with you, Dr. Payne. I didn't, I didn't totally understand that one. Try that again. I said, we, can we still interact with you um, from time to time about our project? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm always, I'm always available to take questions. I've kind of taken a position of not uh, not becoming a supervisor any longer because I tend to do a lot of supervising for all students in one way or another. So I, I really can't take on students as supervisors uh, anymore at this point. But yeah, I'm, I'm glad to you know answer questions that I can anytime that you want to email me. Okay, thank you. That said, Dr. Payne. Um, so, you know, as you've been giving us feedback throughout the course on our proposal submissions, and then we go back and make those changes, or I have been. Um, so then what I'm concerned about now, because this is a big chunk that we're going to all turn in all at one time at the end of this week, it's like a third of it. And then are you going to grade that, or are we going to have an opportunity then to receive feedback? and then go ahead and incorporate that and resend it again before you give us a final grade. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> I've been trying to, you know, I'm going to give feedback on the final chapter. We you know, get that to this week. I'm getting feedback from somewhere. I'm not sure where I'm getting that from. Anyway, if you send me your methodology chapter, you know, by the end of this week, I can give you feedback. So hopefully you will have had feedback on all your chapters by, by the time I finish with that. Some of it gets down to a time issue. I was going to say, if you finish a, you know, your total proposal and want to send it to me before July, before June 16th, I might be able to give you some feedback on that. Sometimes it just gets to a matter of time, how much time I can devote you know in addition to what i will do once you i get your your final proposal on the 16th but you know by the end of this week i guess if you can ask me questions you know in the written assignments i i can try to you know give you feedback there and i'll definitely give you feedback on your methodology chapter i've given you know some of you i've given feedback and said you know you really need to for example in your literature review chapter some of you were kind of not really including the, just the theoretical framework, you were kind of bringing in a lot of other issues. And like I said, the literature review chapter is organized based on the different components of your theoretical framework, right? And so I've, I've made that comment to a few of you uh, to make sure that that's how you organize your literature review chapter. And I, I'll try to make those kinds of comments, you know, on, on other issues as I see them as you turn in your, your, your final chapter here at the end of this week. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. At the end of this week. 
So yeah, I, I, I and cause we're doing the last section. Right. And so when I get that all done for you by uh, the end of this week and you will have received the whole thing right, right. that I have to offer all of my offerings. <laughs> right. And um, then I will look for feedback on that last third basically. And yeah. carefully I can get that incorporated then in to those changes in before the 16th. My concern is I'm actually leaving Ethiopia on Monday, Tuesday oh, wow. week early. And so, and I, I return on the 15th. Oh boy. And okay. so, um, and a lot of what I'm doing there is in relate, you know, well, I'm going. Right, right. The focus group and the interviews and the study, that's part of my thing. And so I'll have clarity actually more in terms of gathering the data and how that all unfolds. Um, once I once I go through that process, yeah. but, my, but I will probably have it all back to you by the sixteenth. You try to yeah. You I can give up to a thirty day extension of this course if you need to. You know, if you need an extension, I can give up to thirty days before we actually go through the formal extension process through the registrar's office. So yeah, in your case, as you go to Ethiopia, that's going to be part of your data gathering. Uh, process so you know if you need to try to give me the proposal a week after the 16th just let me know and, and that will be fine okay but yeah for this week if you if you I'll look at the methodology chapter I'll look at them next week uh, if you will have incorporated all the recommendations I've given to you up to this point I will then make it a point to look back over the other two chapters to make sure that, I, and I'm going to, you know, come, I'm going to scan those fairly briefly, but I'm going to, I can usually see if I think that you've, you've met the, you've met the standard. Okay. At that point. Qu question regarding references again, if, if you have 35 references, 20 are journal articles, 15 are books, is that okay? Or is, or should there be, uh, is, it, is it okay to have a balance like that, or do you want to mainly journal articles? Uh, what's your perspective on that? No, you can have a you can have a balance. I think we've tried to emphasize in the class that we need we want we wanted you to become accustomed to looking at journal articles, peer-reviewed journal articles, and looking at research studies specifically, because too often students tend to leave the out. Okay. okay. As you're in the actual uh, dissertation, you're going to have a balance of journal articles and books, okay, and inter and some internet sites that that we feel that, that are good. We don't want just a lot of popular interview uh, inter, uh, internet sites. We we want them to be uh, we want them to be qualified in the sense of you know, there's expert opinions. Uh, we don't want to just. We don't want a lot of opinion pieces uh, in your in your reference list. Uh, and I, I know that's that's kind of a gray area. That's a subjective area. When somebody writes a book, that's of course written from a particular perspective. Okay, we understand that. Uh, but you know, when you're when you're writing, uh, when you're putting together a reference list, you're going to use journal articles. You're going to use uh, books books by experts within the field that you're talking about or practitioners within that field. You're going to use some, possibly some internet articles. There'll be also on the internet, there's a lot of articles by organizations. You can pick up, you know, organizational reports, uh, annual reports, studies that are done by an organization. Those are valid. Let me just make a point on just on the reference for this entry. If an article, for example, is, is, you don't see an you don't see an author, but there's an organization. Then the name of the organization becomes the first part of the entry. Okay, Department of Health and Human Services. That would become the author, for example. So you know that would be listed under uh, department <laughs> Department of Health and Human Health and Human Services because they were the author. Okay, so yeah, organizations are, are another good source. Uh, one other issue, and I guess I'll mention at this point, because we've started trying to uh, emphasize the, the need for students to not only use the criteria I just talked about in terms of selecting sources for your, for your references, 
Also, we would like you to look at your own context. Okay, uh, you know, Jacqueline, you're you're in Jamaica. Are there some Jamaican writers who are who are writing about the issues that that you're dealing with? That may or may not be, but we want you to try to include contextually, as we call it, writers from your particular uh, context. If there's people within your country are that are working, okay. Sometimes we just get a lot of sources from the U.S. here uh, or from Europe in various places. But if there are people that are doing writing in your context, please try to look at those writings and include them within your, in, within your reference list. They, right now, they may become potential on the potential source list. Okay? But try, to, try to do that. And sometimes you can do that just by using you know, Google, Google Scholar or ProQuest if you put the name of your country in in the title of the search title that you're using, you will then come up with uh, people who are possibly doing studies within your particular country context. Dr. Payne, may I make some observations here? <clears throat> Piggybacking on what you've just said about context, um, speaking specifically to Jacqueline, it wouldn't just be the Jamaican context. Mm. It would be Jamaican slash Caribbean because of the similarity culturally, etc. cetera. Um, going back to the issue of the proposal and its selection of an advisor, I just want to caution you to be patient with respect to the advisor with whom you're working in the sense that I have, I. I'm currently working with students, some students that have been in this class, but um, they've had to do more work for me to be able to, to say, I think this proposal is ready. And I just want to explain that. What Dr. Payne and I are doing with you is taking you through the process that you need to go through. Now, an advisor, one of the characteristics of the person whom you may ask to be an advisor is that person may be a content expert. Mm -hmm. We are not content experts of everything. There are areas that, that we have strengthened as content expert, but we would recommend that one of the criteria you use to select an advisor is to be sure that that person has proficiency in the content of the study that you're doing. Now, when the person looks at it as a content expert, they are going to see gaps. And they're going to say to you, you need to fill these gaps before you take your proposal to the academic committee for approval. So be patient and expect that that will happen. Um, in terms of the content expert. The other thing I want to, um, to, to remind you of is you should not collect data before your advisor has given you approval and said to you, collect data. I have worked with students in the past and it's the worst thing that can happen who go and collect data before they get approval. Well, you know what? You have to go back. You don't do that. You, you, your advisor must give you approval and say, now you're ready to collect data. But don't collect data before advisor approval. Very important. OK? Let me, just, let me make one comment on that one, because I know, let's see, Melissa, you're going to be in a situation. You're going to be in the process of potentially I'm collecting working. data. I'm working with my advisor. OK, but you've got an advisor. Good. All right. <clears throat> um, uh, one question. For example, I did find some books, for example, in Spanish or even in Portuguese, that I could include, but I didn't find the English version of those. And should I include the quotation in the language like Spanish or Portuguese and I make my own translation? Yeah, that, that's perfectly. Yeah, Paulo, you you can have, uh, you know, 
works that are in Portuguese, and that'll just go into your reference list in Portuguese, okay? When you're making, you know, making reference to those, for example, if you give a quotation, uh, you would need to translate that into English since this particular dissertation is being done in English. But in the reference list... Even though it's my, my version of the translation, because there is no translation for that book officially. That's what, it, that's what it'll have to be. Yeah, in terms of, yeah, it, say if you give a quote, it would be your translation. Would that be your, your read on that, Dr. Henry? Turn on your mic. Microphone. Oh, we can't hear you. That would be my first response. However, I think um, I would want to get a second opinion because that's not unique to us. It happens all over. So I right. just would like to see what is the generally accepted um, procedure for that. But certainly we expect you to use works in your first language and to report them, right? Yeah, exactly. What I have seen students do, for example, in a quotation, you know, one, one style is say you're gonna emphasize you're going to put something in italics that wasn't like that in the in the translation in the original. In brackets, you'd put emphasis mine. Probably that same kind of format could be done with a translation. You could put in brackets uh, translation mine. That would be one way to handle that. I think just so that a reader knows this is your your translation. So you'd put that in square brackets, just like a, you would do with emphasis mine. But if we see any other uh, ways of handling that, Dr. Henry and I can just kind of make a, make a note to that, to the class, if we do see that issue somewhere. Hey, Dr. Payne, this is Jeremy. Go ahead, Jeremy. Um, thinking about just timeline stuff, so <laughs> we're you're getting our full draft by the 16th for grade and stuff from you and Dr. Henry. And then it needs to go to our advisor to take a look at. We'll probably get feedback like Dr. Henry was describing and more work. Thinking about that June 30th submission to the academic cabinet, um, which is, you know, like ambitious. It's right in front of us, all that kind of stuff. Um, but in the, uh, in the instance that we aren't able to do that, um, what is our next step? So say we uh, had to put more work into it with our advisor. Does the academic cabinet meet quarterly, monthly? I know the June 30th deadline is kind of in reference to, if you want to graduate by June of 2020, we need to get you in here. But if that's not a concern, for example, or if we're flexible on that, what happens if this June 30 deadline needs to get missed? Is there another deadline we need to pay attention to, or is there a rolling set of deadlines in conjunction with the cabinet? Yeah, the, the cabinet actually meets once a month. We, we meet the first Thursday of every month, okay? Okay. So, you know, putting down June 30th, you know, for graduation in 2020, the, any proposals that are received by June 30th are going to be brought to the academic cabinet by our first meeting in July. Once you start getting past that date, and this is just by experience, you know, you start pushing the acceptance of the proposal down as you get towards, say, toward fall. Now you've really started crunching your timeline to actually do your dissertation work and you can't do a, a good, good work. You know, the first draft for, say, if you're going to graduate 2020, the first draft of your dissertation is due by, I think it's about the first week in December, okay? So even now, you know, getting your proposal in by June 30th, it's giving you six months to be working on the whole research process, interviewing, surveying, writing up. That's still a pretty short timeline. You know, I'm actually encouraging uh, the academic cabinet to, if, to, to kind of make the policy, if you're going to graduate, say, in 2020, June, you would have taken this research class six months ago. You would have started in January and taken the, uh, the winter term. Okay, so even now, you know, you are, you're hitting a pretty, pretty stiff timeline, even once you get that uh, to the academic cabinet for their meeting in July. All that to say, yeah, if, if June 2020 doesn't have to be your target, yeah, then, you know, I think if you want to say graduate in December, we don't actually do a formal uh, graduation ceremony in December, but we do issue uh, degrees in June and December. There's another timeline 
Uh, I think you have to have it to the academic cabinet by, uh, I think I'd have to look it up, September, October, I think, of this year, if you want to say, get, receive your degree in December 2020. Yeah, okay, that's helpful. Yeah, I just wanted to. Slide. Yeah, the timeline slide depending on when you'd like to graduate. Okay, yeah, still hoping for the best, but right. yeah, just getting a sense of contingencies just in case. Gotcha. Thank you. All right, any other pressing questions before we close down today? All right, hearing none. I just think. Um, Melissa's consideration is kind of important for us, like our concern is if we have we included some of the content now and we are going to get the feedback like on June 25th, we have five days to fix all of them. So yeah. it's kind of, I don't know if it's good to have new ideas from now on. <laughs> and include them because we don't have that many days to no i understand to yeah now like i say it, it, the problem is you know taking the class at this time puts you right up against the uh, the deadlines for 2020 20 june and uh, yeah i'm not sure what to tell you I, I, there are times that we will maybe give a month extension you know from at the academic cabinet level if we feel it's justified I know one of the problems, you know, say once you turn in your final projects, then Dr. Henry and I have to review those projects and give you feedback and give grades and to get that all done. Yeah, from June 16th within the next week and a half. So you can have something to, yeah, it's really, really an impossible kind of a situation. Uh, so I, I guess all I can say is do your best if you need an extension and if i say to the academic cabinet you know some of this is an extension uh we as professors have had to grade those uh proposals and then they have to meet with a, you know, a supervisor and we can we submit some of those proposals for an august an august first uh academic cabinet and, and we might be able to look at that I'll, I'll talk that through with our academic cabinet at our next meeting dr payne that begs the question um because in my mind i'm thinking okay i just want to get a proposal um that's quality and and you know legitimate and that i can get a decent grade on it but that is that written in stone i mean we're, i'm working with an advisor and things are going to morph and evolve right as i go through this whole process for certain i'm that's the one thing i am sure of is that there will be you know deviations and evolutions and oh, yeah. and whatever so i feel like whatever i put or don't put in this between now and the 16th of june or whatever it is as long as it passes muster um I, we're continuing to grow and learn in this process of course i mean how can that not be so oh yeah i mean the way our handbook states it and i have to look up the exact wording but it, it says uh, when you submit a proposal that proposal is giving the basic outline of what, what you're going to stay with in terms of your dissertation. It does state you can make minor variations in that proposal uh, that don't have to be reapproved by the academic cabinet. I think I, as the dissertation director, can approve those minor, uh, uh, you know, like you said, as you morph through, through various uh, uh, thinking processes. If you're going to make a major change in your say the way you're going to approach a study then then we have to resubmit that proposal to the academic cabinet if it's already been approved but you know most of your minor changes in thinking and you know working through some you know issues most of that just let me know that you know this is kind of what you're doing and i can just generally approve that you know just as, as the, the the dissertation director That's, at, that's after it's been approved by the academic cabinet. Okay. All right, I've got quarter after the hour, so I think we're gonna close down the session there. Again, do get your, uh, your methodology chapter in by the end of the week, Sunday, Monday, if you have to. I know some of you I've given you uh, permission to do that in on Monday. Uh, 
I'll give you feedback on that chapter and I will just kind of do a quick review of what you've done in the whole proposal and give you my feedback. Once we get into the actual grading, uh, Dr. Henry and I generally kind of split up the different uh, proposal, uh, the proposals and we each uh, will review a proposal and then give you our final feedback, you know, on the ones that you turn in after June 16th. Okay. With that, I'm going to close down the session. And uh, again, it's been uh, a privilege working with you all, and I'm sure I'll keep working with you. <laughs> and, uh, both of us, Dr. Henry and I, will be working with you, I'm sure, over the, over the coming months. And uh, keep at it. Well, I'd like to thank both of you. I'd like to thank both of you for taking us three, three months. Right. We're starting to learn a lot. Thank you very much. All right. Yes, it's been our pleasure. Yeah. Yes, thank you for sharing your information with so much care and attention. You're welcome. Blessings thank on all of you. Thank you, you Dr. Yeah. Claire. Thank you as well. You are welcome. Wonderful comments. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. It's not an easy process. We know that. Uh, okay. okay. Goodbye now. <laughs>